I'm Kim Beal. I'm an art historian and a lecturer at Stanford University. I'm happy to be with you today, wherever and whenever today is for you. I was asked to speak to the forces that are shaping media and communication in the contemporary moment. I don't know about you, but for me, those forces are as much biological as they are technological. So in this talk called How to Break the Rules, I'll start with my most recent experience. Indeed, it's an experience that we've all shared to some extent over the recent months. But these developments in visual culture actually mirror a pattern that has been part of photography since the mid-19th century, and I'll speak to those in the second half of the talk. I'm going to fade into the background now so you can focus on the images. As shelter-in-place restrictions were deployed around the world in March, my life in the San Francisco Bay Area felt rapidly rule-bound. I obeyed the five-mile travel limit imposed by my county, I wore a mask, and I seated space on the sidewalk. But there was one area of life during lockdown that abandoned the long-standing rules, even while it upheld the new physical restrictions. A new genre of photography emerged during the first weeks of shelter-in-place, window portraits. They appeared everywhere, on Instagram, in newspapers and magazines, they featured a picture taken from outside a closed window, prominently showing the reflection of the outside world, overlaid on the occupants who are trapped inside. Windows have featured prominently in art since the Renaissance, when artists began describing paintings as windows, a metaphor that accompanied the development of perspectival rendering. In the 19th century, windows served as subjects that neatly fit the photograph's rectangular frame. But until lately, most of these windows were transparent. For nearly 200 years, photographic instructional manuals warned against distracting reflections. Even in the 1920s, Eugène Ager's photographs of reflections in Parisian shop windows seemed so otherworldly that they served as inspiration to the surrealists. Instead, photographers were taught to hold their lenses against the window glass to avoid reflections, or when possible, they should open the window and shoot straight through it. Jacob Duchesne, who was the New York Times photo columnist, tells photographers in his book, New Ways in Photography, that they should keep the lens always pressed close to the windows. With the outbreak of COVID-19, however, windows in photographs became much more visible. Photographers used reflections to indicate distance between themselves and their subjects. They also used these reflections to emphasize the feeling of being trapped inside behind glass, as in this picture that was featured in the Atlantic. Window pictures prevailed in dozens of photojournalistic essays on Instagram and in newly sponsored institutional repositories of pandemic pictures at the International Center of Photography and at London's National Portrait Gallery. Suddenly, the prohibition against reflections was overturned. We no longer considered windows transparent or inconsequential. Having a barrier between ourselves and the outside world was potentially life-saving for people on both sides of the glass. The inclusion of reflections on window glass made this vital separation visible. But it also allowed the photographer to participate, to project herself virtually into someone else's space and to escape her own physical isolation. Seeing the windows means unseeing something that's around us all the time, reflections. We've become accustomed to the experience of seeing through glass. The advent of the iPad, which combined a touch screen with a glossy surface, taught us to see through those marks. In this photographic series, the artist Tabitha Soren emphasizes the sometimes surreal experience of seeing the world filtered through the traces of your own touch. The iPad's glass screen layers together the distinctive taps of your passcode or the repetitive scrolling and liking of Instagram onto other images. We've become accustomed to toggling back and forth in our vision between the image and the screen. For instance, here, you can probably see your own face in this gray slide. 
Let me make it easier for you. You can probably see yourself even better now on this black background. Even as you're watching this presentation on your own time, in your own time zone, we can come together as you lay your image over this slide. So now I want you to take a selfie of yourself reflected in the screen. Don't worry if your phone is not nearby, I'll wait or you can pause me. So take a selfie and you can email it to me or you can DM it to me on Instagram at K-E-B-E-I-L and I'll send you a discount code for my current book. Okay, if you're not gonna do it, we can move on. If you did, thank you. Thanks for participating, for coming together as a group, no matter how distant we might be. And you're helping me to bend the rules of photography just a little bit. Most rules appear so natural that they're thought of as nothing more than the necessary techniques that result in a good picture. In fact, what we define as a good picture is constantly changing. And the cycles that define these trends were nearly as short-lived in the 19th century as they are today. In my new book, Good Pictures, A History of Popular Photography, I trace 50 of these stylistic trends through 175 years of photographic practice. The elements of pictures that today seem naturally good, such as the best angle for selfies, which is a high angle according to Cosmo, or the best light for portraits, golden hour according to most online sources. These are in fact very recent adaptations. In the next 20 minutes, I'm going to take you on a tour of a few of the trends in popular photography. I'll suggest that breaking the rules is an essential part of photographic practice and that the rule breakers are often unnamed, anonymous, and amateur photographers whose rejection of the status quo is a crucial part of our evolving visual language. After the invention of the Kodak camera in 1888, photography was opened up to amateurs. Earlier cameras were prohibitively expensive and the developing process was still a highly involved and largely experimental one. While the Kodak camera was relatively inexpensive, $25 was still roughly equivalent to three weeks wages for an average worker at the end of the 20th century. More important was the Eastman Kodak Company's invention of the photo finishing industry. Amateur photographers could send their entire Kodak camera back to Rochester, New York, where the film would be unloaded, developed, printed, and then sent back to the user with a fresh roll of film loaded back into the camera. The Eastman Company published a long running series of how-to guides, which accompanied the Kodak number no. one camera and eventually the real sea change, the Kodak Brownie camera, which was released in 1900 and cost only $1. The Kodak guides aimed squarely at a class of entirely untrained amateurs. The famous slogan, you push the button, we do the rest, emphasized the ease of operation of the Brownie. Beginning in 1912, Kodak named their guidebooks, How to Make Good Pictures. The series ran under that same title through the 1990s. Not only did these books offer technical suggestions, but they also established many of the occasions for photographing that are still prevalent today. The guidebooks recommended critical moments in heteronormative family life, from weddings and babies firsts to vacations, holidays, and casual pictures of pets around the home. Despite the large numbers of women and people of color involved in photography since the medium's earliest days, the instructional literature almost universally depicted white men photographers photographing their smiling white wives and children. The rules about good pictures tell us a lot more than just what makes a good picture, but also who can make one. I respond to these instances of rule breaking like window reflections because they represent historical moments when the power structure is inverted. When new trends circulate, they often do so first among photographers and only later are they admitted into the official industry standard handbooks. 
many of these aesthetic changes are unauthored or their original uses are obscured. Sometimes they are pioneered by amateurs and seen casually by friends in slideshows or family albums. Sometimes they are lucky accidents, which are then picked up as a deliberate style by professionals and art photographers. Trends are named eventually in guidebooks, but their authorship is amorphous. They are gathered under the rubric of good pictures rather than the particular innovation or style by any one photographer, whether amateur or professional. One of the earliest examples of amateur-driven change in the Kodak handbooks occurred in the late 1930s, more than a decade after the new aesthetic had been widely adopted by photographers and journalists. Since the advent of the hand camera in the late 19th century, when the instrument was finally unmoored from its stable tripod, instructional guides had warned of the distorting effects of photographing at an angle. Pointing the camera up at tall buildings created an exaggerated sense of height. A failure to level the camera against the horizon also caused unnatural effects. It appeared to make boats sail downhill, according to the Kodak handbook. These effects were associated with amateurism. For most of photography's history, textbooks aimed to correct rather than encourage such unconventional visions. Charles Taylor's 1902 manual, called Why My Photographs Are Bad, provided an illustration of one of these offending angles. Taylor explained, I have known amateurs to overcome all the early difficulties in photography, and yet to fail repeatedly in their pictures because they forgot to make sure that the camera was perfectly level while focusing. Catherine Stanbury also listed inappropriate angles among the most common beginner's troubles in her 1911 handbook. She warned the camera should be held level with the subject, not pointed up or down at it, whether the subject be a tall building or a clump of fern by the brookside. Pictures like these were broadly scorned by instructional authors. But in the mid-1920s, the avant-garde photographers Alexander Rodchenko and Laszlo Moholinaj embraced these supposed failures, which were the products of legions of amateur photographers. Rodchenko and Moholinaj began intentionally aiming their cameras up at apartment buildings and down on people in the street. They tilted their cameras to transform horizontal lines into dramatic diagonals. The handheld camera's size and maneuverability freed them from the static perspectives long naturalized in painting and reinforced by cameras mounted on tripods during the 19th century. Rodchenko argued that these new angles were critical tools for modernity. He said, we who are accustomed to seeing the usual, the accepted, must reveal the world of sight we must revolutionize our visual reasoning. Widely published in the nascent picture magazines, angled shots quickly became associated with the energy and unconventional ideals of modernism. The Kodak handbook incorporated the new angles by the late 1930s, suggesting that, quote, interesting and odd views are obtained from the windows of high buildings pointing the camera down. Looking down on the chaotic arrangement of urban street traffic, counterbalanced by hard shadows, became a popular trope. Jacob Duchesne recommended that our amateurs seek out angle shots, either in the mid-morning or late afternoon, when, he said, quote, an idle walk about town should yield a good harvest of photos. Graphic compositions gazed up at skyscrapers, exaggerating their converging orthogonal lines. One amateur textbook reproduced an image strongly reminiscent of Lucia Moholy's Bauhaus Balconies photograph, captioning it, quote, modern flats photographed from the new angle. The 1940 edition of Kodak's How to Make Good Pictures even included a new section titled The Unusual Vantage Point. The editors wrote, Quote, expert photographers are today finding new angles from which to make their pictures, and for the most part, the results are pleasing, as well as attractive and unusual. 
Many amateurs are also finding a new interest in seeking and achieving something different. They too are shooting from positions that are daring and new. The Kodak Guide finally sanctioned the worm's eye view, reasoning that, after all, if you look up at a tall building, your eyes do actually see the vertical lines converging towards the top. So why should not a photograph of the same building show the same effect? By the 1950s, many handbooks were also instructing readers in how to successfully deploy the tilted horizon effect. This is photography, a popular 50s guide explained. The same subject is given enhanced interest and vitality by slightly raising and tilting the camera to produce a more dynamic compositional scheme. Ever the disciplinarians, though, the Kodak editors warned, quote, there is all the difference in the world between deliberately tilting your camera to obtain some novel or unusual effect and accidentally holding it slightly out of the straight when the resulting picture merely looks carelessly composed. As with many trends that repurposed accidental effects or technical errors, the instructional literature was adamant about the need to apply such effects intentionally rather than haphazardly. With the sweeping popularity of the unusual angle, there also came criticism. Arthur Hammond, an editor of American Photography and the author of a multi-edition textbook on composition, was skeptical. He wrote, quote, it seems to me that the wave of modernism that is sweeping over present day pictorial photography is very largely due to a natural desire to get ahead of the other fellow. Someone makes a picture showing some interesting curves of part of a spiral staircase and someone else does him one better by placing his camera on the floor in the center of the spiral, looking up, and thus getting the entire corkscrew effect. Then the only thing to do in order to be different is to get a similar view of a spiral staircase looking down from above instead of up from below. Certainly, the faddish currents of modern photography moved at a dizzying pace compared with 19th century trends which relied on the passing of card photographs hand to hand or making infrequent visits to exhibitions. But Hammond's rant also hints at a concern for the future of the medium and for the instructional genre in particular. What happens when the established compositional rules no longer apply? What happens when bad photographs become art? The critical response to the mid-20th century's penchant for motion blur put these questions at the center of the debate over photographic style. In advertising and editorial work of the late 1950s and early 1960s, professional photographers exploited slow shutter speeds and camera movement to create the dramatic new visual style. Unlike the blurs that occurred in the 19th century when models moved during long exposures, Photographers working in the middle of the 20th century intentionally used a slow shutter speed and moved their cameras to track the moving subject. By panning with the subject in motion, these photographs created a dynamic contrast between pervasively blurred backgrounds and sharp, though moving, subjects. Through this inversion, photographers placed viewers inside the image. The motion blur technique was seized upon by sports photographers and the automotive industry to convey experiences of speed, transforming viewers from distant observers into participants in the action. But the handbooks held fast to the rules for a few more years. The author of a 1957 article in Popular Photography warned that the fad threatened a de-skilling of photography. He wrote, to blur or not to blur is not the question if you are still toddling through the first steps of photography. To combat this possibility, the magazine had offered elaborate tutorials almost annually since 1955, which emphasized the expertise required to create a sophisticated blur. In 1962, popular photography would ask, are photographers going blur crazy? By this point, the photo magazines were fully complicit in the trend. 
A U.S. camera article published at the same time invited readers to weigh in on the debate, and they pro proclaimed the battle over blur, creative tool or sloppy technique, you tell us. Most trends in photography have followed a similar life cycle. They are pioneered by a few individuals, then widely seen, adopted by other photographers and heralded as the new good pictures. They are eventually sanctioned by instructional guides, but soon after, when they've reached critical mass, they're derided as too popular and too trendy. Often, it's at this point that the trend is named, specifically so that it can be criticized in the press. One of the earliest named trends in photography exhibited this life cycle during its first decade, even though the trend persists to this day. The Rembrandt effect was invented in 1868 by the New York Society photographer William Kurtz. He used reflectors to create a sense of dimensionality in head and shoulder portraits through the introduction of shadows, which recalled the dark paintings of the Dutch old master. Since early photographic processes demanded such a prodigious quantity of light, most studios were located on a building's top floor and lit by skylights. Early guides suggested limiting the number of light sources to just one large window, though skylights were preferred above all else, even though overhead lighting cast dark shadows under the brow, nose, and chin. These shadows were marked limitations in early portrait photography, and practitioners worked hard to eliminate them in deference to their clients' wishes. As one would-be critic allowed of Rembrandt effects, quote, doubtless the most important gain realized by this new style photograph will be to crush out the old prejudices against shadow. Every provincial operator has wept over the unappreciative rustics who insist on having their faces taken like the full moon, square to front and in complete light, whilst others refuse a three-quarter head because it is, quote, too black on one side. The obvious racial prejudices are evident to us now in these comments. Monochrome photography allowed an equalization of skin tone, which was threatening to many white sitters and critics, including the notable Oliver Wendell Holmes, who criticized the dusky effects of shadows in photographic portraits, borrowing a racial epithet to describe his discomfort. At the end of the next year, the editor of the Philadelphia photographer, Edward L. Wilson, noted that Rembrandt effects were, quote, quite the rage in 1869. Other how-to authors provided advice for making portraits in Kurtz's highly sought-after style. Some suggested using the device patented by Kurtz himself, a large folding reflector that created a frame through which the camera peered at the subject, while the side panels could be adjusted to focus window light onto the subject. By 1870, however, critics of the style emerged, describing Rembrandt effects as, quote, unnatural and extravagant. Others claimed that the technique had so completely saturated the market that all portraits were beginning to look the same. These criticisms, which seem to be born of the social media age, are in fact much older. While contemporary accounts like Insta Repeat show the remarkable similarity of pictures on Instagram, these 19th century commentators were in effect making the same criticisms almost 150 years earlier. On close inspection, critics from both eras take aim not only at the style of the picture, but also at their subjects. In the 19th century, critics attacked the portrait sitters who were deemed unworthy of such a chic treatment. In Kurtz's published defense of his style, he made the democratic argument that, quote, commonplace or ordinary faces when lighted in an ordinary manner will always remain ordinary. One of his detractors reversed this, asking, quote, and why should they not remain ordinary? Molly the cook has a fat, chubby, good-natured face, which, lighted in an ordinary manner, will present the picture of a respectable cook. 
but lighted in an extraordinary manner, it may, by startling effects of light and shade, be made to suggest a Lady Macbeth. This analysis reveals the complexities of separating photographic form from content, the Rembrandt effect from its effect on a particular sitter. Scorn for Rembrandt-style lighting and its rise in popularity found as much fault with the people having their pictures taken in a fashionable new style as with the style itself. Kurtz responded to one such bitter attack levied in the British periodical Photographic News by sacrificing his fellow photographers, but not their clients. He said, quote, I am led to suppose from this very severe criticism that this writer has only seen some atrocious imitations by our rural photographers and upon which rests the sole foundation of his argument. Kurtz continues in a second published letter, quote, if some, in making the style of picture, overstep a certain limit and produce work that is simply ridiculous, it is hardly fair to condemn the whole thing. The best of portraits can be, and are, made in this style, as we can see in the long-lasting impact of Rembrandt effect pictures today. They remain a popular project for contemporary social media photographers and were even described in Kodak's How to Make Good Pictures in 1952, as well as in later manuals. Trends are often accompanied by Booster's insistence that the new style represents the best or most natural way of making pictures. As the rise and fall of Rembrandt effect makes clear, however, from the very beginning, trends and representation are intimately linked with what or who they represent. Having one's portrait made in the new style says as much about the yeoman's urban aspiration as the quality of his portraitist and the photographer's mastery over new techniques. It's perhaps little wonder then that American sophisticates would protect their tenuous hold on a newly attained social standing by volleying accusations of impropriety at the trend itself, which was less vocal in its defense than the people it was used to represent. I think of these rural operators adopting new photographic styles and rejecting the predominant rules as waging a small visual revolution one which had profound class implications. If seeing yourself in a new station makes that striving possible, then showing yourself to the world in such a situation is doubly important. Rejecting the class hierarchies of the time, which were upheld by the rules reproduced in guidebooks, makes photographic representation a key site of social change. Each instance where a user takes control, whether they are overriding functions on a smartphone camera or abandoning the rule book, is a minor revolution. How people take pictures, how they represent themselves in the world, and how they represent that world to others, these can each be revolutionary practices. They are sites where hegemony is rejected and a new kind of good picture is imagined. If we accept that photographs are crucial to historical memory, then having an active part in constructing this memory and representing oneself in ways that are honest, empowering, and self-determined are all modes of protest that will reverberate through history. The rule books are effectively built into smartphone cameras now. The Google Pixel camera and the iPhone 11 both correct everything from camera shake at night to lighting in portrait modes and even framing. The decline of printed handbooks doesn't suggest that we have won. Instead, it makes questioning the rules more urgent than ever. The invisibility and anonymity of the built-in rulebook makes it even harder to ask a question that has long been ignored by instructional literature. Who makes good pictures? The Kodak guidebooks of the 20th century reproduced highly gendered expectation of who takes the picture and who poses for it. Even the very film stock that Kodak was selling was color balanced to privileged white skin, as the communications scholar Lorna Roth has shown in her study of the company's Shirley cards. These pre-printed cards featured at first a white Kodak employee named Shirley her image was distributed to film processing labs around the United States to help their technicians establish color balance in portraits. 
Shirley cards, like many other aspects of visual culture, assumed that white skin was normal. Even though we know that 2.7 billion people around the world own smartphones with cameras, the percentage of people who write the rules for digital picture taking is more exclusive than ever. Who makes good pictures now? For smartphone cameras, the answer is often a team of software engineers. In addition to the more elaborate techniques of computational photography, Camera software also determines the presets for simpler questions about color rendering, saturation, and contrast. These may seem harmless enough until you also consider that even a simple choice about contrast requires a camera that recognizes and validates a wide spectrum of skin tones in an equally wide spectrum of lighting situations. It matters who makes these decisions, and it matters that users can break the rules when desired. As the world reopens, the windows are reopening too, and window reflection portraits are disappearing. The three month period from March through May of 2020 might mark one of the shortest trend life cycles in photographic history. If it follows the pattern of either stylistic trends, window reflection portraits will be reminders of a particular moment in history for a short time. They will be identified with the persistence of art during a global pandemic rather than poor photographic technique. They will be linked with the desire to come together through photography, even when distance is required. But eventually the trend will return and its earlier associations will be cast off or forgotten, just as the Rembrandt effect became normalized for portrait photography in the late 19th century or motion blur went from a failure to an intentional aesthetic effect in the late 1950s. Photographic styles adapt to new contexts and they take on new meanings. Even the rules for the new good pictures will be overturned and that's exactly as it should be. Thank you. <laughs>